welcome to Euro PCR 2021. Today, I'm here. Uh, I, my name is Roxana Moran from uh, New York, and I'm here with the most wonderful uh, group here, uh, Professor Marie-Claude Maurice, my partner uh, on so many levels uh, from France, uh, Professor Alexandre Abizaid from uh, uh, Brazil, Sao Paulo, Brazil, and uh, Professor Luca from Italy, as well as uh, Professor Antonio Colombo from Italy. We have a fantastic um, session here for you today, focusing on uh, uh, diabetes, uh, Abluminous DES, an innovative solution going global to beat diabetes. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Uh, let's begin uh, with the uh, addressing the unmet needs of the overlooked diabetic patients. And I think we need to kind of think about this. And I, I'm wondering if um, we will have a wonderful discussion around this right after this talk. Thank you very much for having me uh, to include addressing the unmet needs of overlooked diabetic patients. These are my important disclosures. Please note that I will be discussing the abluminous um, a DES, which is a um, concept medical um, uh, device. And uh, I'm currently on the executive committee of the Ability DM study. The global prevalence of diabetes mellitus is on the rise. Over 422 million adults have diabetes with deaths, including 1.5 million deaths caused by diabetes on a yearly basis. This prevalence has increased um, in adults twice as much over the last four decades and a 5% increase in premature mortality in diabetes. In fact, we see this in our cath labs. This is a frequent comorbidity amongst patients with PCI. In our cath lab at Mount Sinai over the, la over the period of January of 2009 to 2014, 47% of the patients undergoing PCI had diabetes. We also know that the, these patients have more complex coronary anatomy and their lesions are more complex with increased necrotic core volume, increased inflammatory infiltrates and calcifications. And this leads to increased events, especially restenosis and target lesion revascularization. We see focal edge as well as diffuse patterns of instant restenosis. We also see higher rates of acute and subacute stent thrombosis. This could be due to delayed vessel healing, slow endothelialization, and an increased inflammatory response that diabetic patients have. In fact, if you look at the SPIRIT-4 trials in over 3,600 patients with um, lesions treated with the best generation ever all almost eluding stent, you can see that most of the benefit of the second generation DES was limited to patients with no diabetes. In fact, diabetic patients did not have an improved outcome with the ever all almost eluding stents. And in fact, those patients with insulin requiring diabetes had high event rates. The characterization of a, of a stent does influence its angiographic outcomes. This includes the strut thickness, the thinner, the better. The polymer, having a biodegradable polymer with a good distribution, whether it's abluminal or conformal. And then of course, polymer degradation. The type of an anti-proliferative uh, uh, agent and a very important stent balloon relationship could be important in angiographic outcomes. If we look at the current designs, we see that over the last decade, there's been a tremendous improvement in strut, strut thickness, as well as in delivery of the drug in the abluminal surface, and as well as the uh, important um, uh, drug and uh, the um, uh, ability to enhance the current outcomes of our patients. Let me discuss the abluminous DES. This is a, a, a drug-eluting stent that carries the drug on the abluminal surface of the stent and as well as the balloon. Very important that we see that the exposed part of the balloon as well as 0.5 millimeters off the, on the balloon distal and proximal edges of the stent 
have the drug on it so that it can hopefully deal with the edge restenosis that we often see in our diabetic patients. And if we look at the differences between current drug-eluting stent specs as, and compare this to the abluminous drug-eluting stent, you see the big difference. In the current drug-eluting stent technical specifications, crimping occurs after the coating. So the coating of the stent is done on sheets, and then the crimping comes onto the balloon. There's dual side coating in, in some of the uh, current generation, and we see focal restenosis and edge restenosis. In contrast, the abluminous DES has a pre-crimped coating. In other words, there's uniform coating layer that's achieved as the, um, um, as the stent is priorly uh, crimped onto the balloon. The abluminal coating hopefully helps with the reendothelialization as well as because of the balloon coating, the edge and focal restenosis should be taken care of because there will be a uniform homogeneous distribution of the drug. We also see that in diffuse disease, this is very, very important. And having that kind of a, a balloon um, and stent coated with the drug could help, especially in our diabetic patients. And it may also have a role in acute MI patients uh, because of this biodegradable film creating, uh, created upon inflation, there could be some uh, protection against no reflow, slow flow. The preclinical experience with abluminous drug eluting stent has been vast. This is a serolimus eluting stent, and it has been um, evaluated versus bare metal stents, showing a really excellent result with low infl inflammatory um, uh, cells and an excellent result. And as such, we're moving towards a prospective largest ever diabetic patient study undergoing PCI with 3,000 patients to be randomized between abluminous DES versus a varoma saluting stent with a primary endpoint of target lesion failure, which includes TLR and the hard endpoints of death MI stent thrombosis. And then, of course, uh, ischemia-driven target lesion revascularization at one year, where we think we will have the most impact with this particular stent. Of the 3,000 patients, 500 patients have been enrolled despite COVID, and we look forward to a fast finish line on this trial and presenting it to you all. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, prior studies have shown that we see worse angiographic results and clinical outcomes in our patients with diabetes. Diabetes is on the rise. The complex, complex lesions in patients will be presented for PCI. The current DES has not addressed all of the issues that diabetic patients have. The abluminous DES has this unique coating technology on both the abluminal surface of the stent as well as the exposed area of the balloon. This could be a huge value for our diabetic patients. The ongoing studies will give us the answer that to make sure that this um, stent will deliver what it promises as far as reducing TLR in diabetic patients, but at least being as effective as current generation drug eluding stents. Thank you so much for your attention and thank you for having me at EuroPCR 2021. Thank you. Um, I have a wonderful, uh, wonderful group here, Marie-Claude Maurice, uh, Alex Abizide and Antonio Colombo. Let me turn my attention to my co-chair, Dr. Colombo. Uh, what's been your frustration about diabetes? Are you, uh, I know that you would hate to have to send patients to surgery, but you know, our current guidelines are telling us that patients with diabetes with even two vessel disease should be evaluated by a heart team and go to surgery because we just don't get good results with current generation DES. What's your answer to that? But, you know, I think uh, the freedom trial uh, gave us partially this answer because uh, uh, as a group, uh, diabetic patients do better with bypass surgery as a group. But uh, nevertheless, there are some uh, subgroups where bypass surgery may not be the ideal uh, choice. Elderly patient, 85 years old with diabetes, I think uh, even if you have restenosis, uh, 
uh, it uh, can be handled. Uh, LED with diffuse disease, uh, no good target for bypass. So I think uh, uh, until we have a solid data uh, and way, and I hope this uh, Bluminous trial will give us uh, some information, we still need to be selective uh, and we have to give prioritized surgery for diabetics. Nevertheless, I believe there are about 20% of diabetics which, for whatever reason, may not be ideal for bypass surgery. Age, comorbidity, type of disease, length of the LED. If the LED is very short, I see no much point to bypass, etc. So that's my current philosophy, which may change in the few years to come. But uh, I think at this point, uh, we need uh, uh, to be like in this frame. Of course, the trials are made to make us change our ideas. And that's the reason why we do the trial. No, it's, it's, it's great. And thank you for that. Uh, uh, Dr. Abazide Alexandre, what's your, what's your view and how are you handling uh, your diabetic patients in Brazil? Is the incidence decreasing, increasing? Are you seeing more diabetic patients in the lab? It's really increasing, Roxana, and not only diabetes by itself, but the combination of exactly what Antonio said. You know, elderly and many comorbidities, and at least one-fourth of these patients are not great candidates for surgery. So we have to deal with these patients in our cath lab every day, not to mention high risk of bleeding, as you are very experts. So I think that when I see a more diffuse disease patient, uh, even with a, a smaller LED that will have perhaps a, a more disease in the left circuit and, 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 and right coronary arteries, I feel like performing intervention more than sending these patients to surgery. But again, we have to deal with, uh, with these patients with diffuse disease, which is a big challenge. And, and sometimes, you know, less is more. So uh, instead of putting multiple metal, multiple uh, metallic stents, sometimes I do the combination of uh, drug eluting balloon with a metallic scaffold. No, it's interesting. Marie-Claude, uh, what's your feeling about, uh, you know, you led so many of these complex uh, interventional trials and um, the frustration in diabetes, uh, even in, uh, you know, the, the trials you've led, uh, has made us uh, really upset. But now there's great uh, medical management too. What, where do you see the future for our diabetic patients? Um, uh, thank you. Thank you, Ros Roxana, for asking. Uh, first, let's say in Europe, we have a little less diabetic than, uh, than, uh, than what you showed. Uh, we, we are still below 30%, but it's increasing a lot. Uh, it was uh, 20% uh, a few years ago. And um, uh, let's say uh, uh, both I agree with uh, you all, but uh, at, uh, in Masia, uh, let's say we think that um, surgery is a default. Uh, uh, let's say we'll try to, t uh, as soon as we are uh, convinced that we do as good as surgery, PCI is preferred, is our preferred approach. Uh, even in diabetic patients, I think that we treat by PCI more than 20%. Uh, that uh, as um, as uh, was saying uh, Antonio, but um, really uh, there is a, there is a need, and uh, honestly, uh, uh, Roxana, you were the one who designed this trial, so uh, uh, you are the chairman of uh, of uh, this trial, and uh, you were the one who convinced the company to run a so big trial. So, um, what did, did you have in mind when you designed uh, that? Yeah, no, you know, I, I've always said for big problems, we need big answers. We need definitive answers. We can't just beat around the bush. Diabetes is a very, very big problem. And uh, I felt that it was important to be bold and effective and to lead the way. And I think that's what we're doing in Ability. And I can't wait to hear your talk. But before we get there, we're going to go to Alexandre Abizaid from Sao Paulo, Brazil. He's going to talk to us about beating the complexity of diabetes with simplicity of en Envision Enviso Solution Technology. Wow, I can't wait to hear this. Dr. Abazide. 
First, I would like to thank EuroPCR and Concept Medical for the opportunity to discuss a very important topic. Today, we will cover the issue of diabetes and PCI. Needless to say that the patients that undergo stenting will have a worse outcome as compared to non-diabetic patients with the same procedure. The mechanism of worse outcomes resides on the fact that these patients will certainly have more diffuse disease, longer lesion, smaller vessels, and the reaction towards stenting is not as pleasant as we see with non-diabetic patients. They certainly have more intimal hypoplasia, more edge restenosis, and the thrombogenic milieu also facilitates the occurrence of thrombosis. So it's very, very important to introduce new technology to try to overcome some of the major limitations we have in diabetic patients. And I'm pleased to present one very promising technology, which really combines several features that can really help us to improve the outcomes in diabetic patients. So we are talking about Abiluminous DS. This stent has, as I mentioned, multiple features. It's a very thin strut device, which causes uh, less injury to the vessel wall. It has this abiluminal coating, which really facilitates the monodirection drug release, goes to the vessel wall, and the drug doesn't go uh, to the uh, lumen, which is uh, something that we want to target. It has the so-called fusion coating that combines the stent coating with balloon coating. So it's a combination of a drug eluting stent with a drug eluting balloon that can really covers more vessel wall in terms of uh, touching and the releasing drug in a more homogeneous way. Not only when the struts will touch the wall, but also due to the balloon drug coating feature, we're gonna have more drug transferred to the vessel wall, which is particularly very important in the diabetic population. Also, it has the a special edge coating, which really avoids more injury at the edges. So a little bit more closed cells and more coating at the edge, both edges of the stent, we will release more drug and cause less injury. And finally, to avoid the loss of drug uh, during the journey to get into the coronary uh, site, you see this biodegradable film that covers the entire platform protecting the drug not to be released where you don't want the drug to be released. So I think that those features can really be extremely promising to treat diabetic patients. There are some important preliminary data, important registries performed in Europe, uh, based conducted by Luca Testa, and he has the opportunity to present that in these registries, he was very impressed with the results in the diabetic population with very low event rates, including death, MI, stent thrombosis, and uh, bleeding, since we don't require a, a extremely aggressive duantiplatter therapy in these patients. So again, this slide shows that uh, Abiluminus is very competitive comparing to uh, other platforms, the 73 microns. And again, cobalt chromium releasing a limus drug, serolimus, to the vessel wall. Uh, in this uh, last few minutes, I would like to highlight and to show the design of the Ability Diabetic Global Study. It's a combined effort between United States, Europe, and several other countries with uh, two very important chairwomen, uh, Roxana Meran and um, um, Marie-Claude Maurice, and, and they were really the mentors to help uh, the PIs and all the investigators to conduct and to design this study. It's again a randomized trial, perhaps the largest of its kind in diabetic populations with PCI. 3,000 patients that will be randomized 
Zeiss versus Abiluminus. And again, we're going to have multiple follow-up times, but the main objective of this trial is to test the efficacy and safety of, of Abiluminus DS versus Zeiss in the diabetic population eligible for PCI with minimal inclusion criteria. So this is a very real world kind of um, study, which is very, very important. And the primary point will be the ischemia driven TLR at one year, powered not only for non inferiority, but also for superiority, which is also very unique about this study and very bold to introduce a new platform and design a study also to be superior. So it's going to be an important study that is very active in rolling patients right now. So uh, the, the operators, of course, will be unblinded to deploy uh, the stent. They are different. Uh, but from the deployment on, uh, the study is blinded. All the study coordinators that will do the phone follow-ups, the presence follow-up up to two years. And uh, it's going to be a very important study design to test this uh, novel device against the current uh, workhorse. As I mentioned, several countries contributing with patients uh, in, in several continents. And the enrollment is up to 20%, I would say close to 600 patients. There was a slow during the COVID uh, months, but hopefully we're going to uh, recover the enrollment and, and we'll be, be able to present this uh, very interesting data in less than two years. With that, I thank you so much for your attention. Wow, what a wonderful, uh, wonderful overview of this important technology. And now I have uh, Luca Testa joining us uh, from uh, Milan, uh, from, from Italy. Thank you so much uh, for being with us. Uh, so what, you know, you have a lot of experience with this technology. Tell us what excites you and what are you worried about? Luca Testa. Well, Roxana, well, that's a complicated question. And then for the sake of time, I'll try to be, you know, very, you know, very straight to the point. So I can tell you that when I started using this device, I was actually thinking there was just another DES, you know, in the shelf. And, uh, you know, before acquiring some experience, but I actually had a look at the preliminary data. And these data were very, I must say, very puzzling to me because there was actually the same safety and efficacy profile in patients with versus without diabetes. So in other words, the presence of diabetes was not a key signal in terms of events, which is, was very strange to me. So I said, look, maybe this, is, this might be a solution for that specific target. And then almost four years ago, I, I started to use these this devices. And then, you know, I must say that initially I thought, that merging the two, let's say, features of a drug-coded balloon plus drug-eluting stent, in my mind, had the consequence of being, you know, not very deliverable, maybe very stiff. You know, I was worried about the possibility to have a suboptimal trackability. Well, this is not the case. So, in other words, in terms of performance, technical performance, this device actually behaves, well, likewise any other up-to-date DES. In terms of safety and efficacy at the moment, I only have my experience. And my experience, of course, is not science. It's not evidence-based, but definitely it's something really encouraging. And as Alexander said before, there was a very strong rationale to create the largest trial so far in this field. So I'm very excited to see what's going to happen in the, in the near future with your help. No, thank you so much. I mean, I think you make a great, great uh, point here. Um, Antonio, um, your experience with this device, um, tell us a little bit. Are you actually choosing to use it in more complex uh, lesions and patients, more diffuse disease? Or do you buy the idea of the homogeneous distribution of drug because of this um, interesting coding technology? But, uh, Roxana, we only use this device uh, in the context of the trial. So uh, I have uh, no uh, real-life experience with this device uh, except uh, inside the ability trial and uh, a limited experience in a pre-ability 
uh, trial with OCT to compare the, uh, the hyperplasia to the science. It's a small OCT endpoint study. Uh, as far as I uh, have experience, I share with uh, Luca about the deliverability. This device is like any DS, uh, new generation DS. Uh, but uh, I cannot answer uh, about the performance in terms of uh, risk stenosis. No, oh, very interesting. And I'm, I, I love your transparency. And I think that's why we want to do all of these uh, uh, major studies going forward. Uh, so, um, Dr. Abazide, uh, Alexandre, what's your experience? And what are you, what are you, what are you hoping for uh, with, this, uh, with this technology? So, so as you know, Roxana, we are very active here in Brazil enrolling patients for ability, right? So first of all, what impresses me, and, and thank you for helping to design this study, that there's very limited exclusion criteria. So essentially, we can, can include all patients except for very large SVGs and patients with very recent MI. Other than that, I have many patients with uh, total occlusions, very diffuse disease, multiple vessel disease, so this is the kind of uh, diabetic patients that we see in our daily practice. And, uh, and again, I think that uh, before ability, I haven't seen any, as I mentioned in my lecture, any bold study that will test a new technology. Um, I think we can talk about drugs. We have to accept the fact that uh, in, in most patients with diabetes, surgery will do better. We discuss in, in my team here, putting a, a, a lima to the LAT without opening the chest and putting some abilities in, in the, uh, I'm sorry, and some abiluminous in the left circ and, and, and right coronary arteries. There's all kinds of uh, combination. Uh, and, and again, bifurcation with drug eluting balloon in the side branch. But at the end of the day, uh, there has not been in the device world any good solution for diabetes. So I have a, a lot of hope for this device, but again, we can only prove scientifically after we see the results of uh, ability, and again, hopefully very soon. Well, thank you for this. One, uh, Roxana, yeah. if I can make a remark, uh, it's very important to have a good device, uh, uh, the best DS with this combination. Nevertheless, uh, we have to take into account that diabetics uh, have uh, calcific lesion, uh, severe calcification, so vessel preparation is a paramount importance. And uh, nowadays, uh, uh, you should not be afraid to use rotablator, shock wave, high pressure balloon in the same lesion, because uh, the stent is good, but a good stent without appropriate lesion preparation does not perform as expected. So no, I think this is a really, really important point. Rely everything on the device, but it's a combination. No, no, thank you. It's really important, as is imaging, which you've taught us so much about. Well, this has been a great discussion. Let's uh, move now to, to the clinical programs. Uh, Dr. Luca Testa will give us an update on Abluminous DES, what kind of robust clinical programs he's been involved in. Let's hear from you, Dr. Luca. Hello, everybody. It's my pleasure to participate to the program of the EuroPCR 2021. And it's also, I'm also honored to show you the, this presentation concerning the Abluminous Desplast technology, in particular focusing on the updates on the robust clinical programs so far. Let's start from these potential confidence that, that I don't have, but also let's start from this, this story. Well, everything started a few years ago with some preliminary data collected in the Enable One study, followed by the Enable E registry. And these two registries are already closed and published. And then now, in uh, the recent years, we started a dedicated still ongoing, and then the ability to randomize control trial, the pilot one, and also the one still ongoing is the ability diabetes global. Let's start from the beginning. The beginning was a few years ago, as I said before, in the Enable E1 study, the first in many clinical evaluation of a luminous death plus for the assessment of safety and efficacy in treatment of coronary artery disease. Well, the PI was my friend Dr. Samir Dani from Ahmedabad in India, and likewise, any other first in many clinical evaluation 
This was a relatively small study where some angiographic follow-up and angiographic endpoints. In particular, the design was simple. A prospective single-centered, non-randomized clinical trial for the evaluation, as I said, of luminous dust plus in real-world scenario. And the primary endpoint was the instant late lumen loss at six months evaluated by means of QCA. And that was actually the patient and lesion characteristics. As you can see immediately, there is a very high percentage of patients with diabetes, or over 40%. And these are the results. As I said, QCA at six months, showing that the late lumen loss was 0.17 plus minus 0.2, and the instant late lumen loss was 0.24 plus minus 0.3. So very encouraging results. But as I said before, this was first in man clinical evaluation. It has been followed by the much larger enabled e-registry, which was a postmark registry of the Abluminous Dust Plus Rolling Moserudin Stent. And again, my friend Dr. Danny from Ahmedabad was the leading PI. It has been actually performed in India in 31 centers. And the study design was again a relatively simple, multi-center prospected all comers ongoing registry. The study endpoints was major adverse cardiovascular events, which is a composite of cardiac death, target vessel MI, target lesion, vessel revascularization at one year follow-up. And the secondary endpoint, the central thrombosis rate and the MACE assessed up to three years. As you can see the baseline characteristics, there is still a very high percentage of patients with diabetes and also a very high percentage of patients with acute coronary syndromes. And these are the results. As you can see, there was a powerful performance across all the clinical endpoints with very low rate of MACE, cardiac death, target vessel MI, target lesion, target vessel vascularization, and stent thrombosis at one year as well as two years. According to the subgroup analysis, we didn't find specific deep differences besides patients with a small vessel with multivessel disease and overlapping DES. But as you can see in the fourth row, there was no difference according to the presence or not of diabetes. Indeed, we proceeded with the analysis. And as you can see from this slide, you see that the, patient, the overall population counted for 2,500 patients and uh, almost 900 patients had diabetes. These are the results of the comparison according to diabetes status. And as you can see, there was no significant difference in all the endpoints according to the presence or not of diabetes. We also did this kind of analysis according to the present clinical presentation, acute myocardial infarction versus no acute myocardial infarction. And again, there was very strong consistency of this technology in patients with versus patients without acute myocardial infarction with very similar rates of MACE, cardiac death, target vessel MI, and so on. From that idea, from that preliminary results, that there was the intention to proceed with a clinical evaluation. Then we performed, we started a dedicated registry in which I am, I'm honored to be the PI. This dedicated registry had one objective. The purpose was to capture the clinical data of the Venus Cirolimus Luding in real world all camera patients with diabetes. So this registry has been designed to specifically address the performance of this technology in patients with diabetes, according to the preliminary data that I showed you a few seconds ago. The study design was prospective, observational, multi-center, worldwide clinical registry, and the target is 5,000 patients. Indeed, this registry is still ongoing. The primary point was a relatively more modern uh, endpoint, in, indeed, it was a target lesion failure, such as a composite of cardiac death, target vessel MI, and clinically indicated target lesion vascularization within 12 months, and a full list of secondary endpoints. That's the study schedule, but I will go directly to the participating sites in the UK, Italy, Romania, Malaysia, and India. And that's the status. So far, we enrolled oh, slightly over 1,300 patients, but as I said, it's still ongoing. And then from the preliminary result, the ability randomized control trial, the pilot one has been designed. This was a randomized clinical trial of a bluminous dust plus cyrolimus eluding stent versus a verolimus eluding drug eluding stent for percutaneous coronary intervention in patients with diabetes mellitus. Two of my very good friends are the PIs, Dr. Azim Latib from US and Dr. Antonio Colombo from Italy. The ability randomized control trial decided to compare the angiographic and clinical performance of a Bluminous Dust Plus versus the Eurolimus eluding DS in patients with diabetes. 
The study design is getting slightly more complex. Multi-center, single-blind, randomized, investigator-initiated in seven Italian sites. And the primary endpoint is the instant new intimal volume and nine-month follow-up measured with OCT, following PCI, as I said, with a bluminous compared with the Everolimus family. And again, a full list of secondary endpoints. And that's the status. We targeted 180 patients, and we are more, almost there because the total patients enrolled so far is 148. And then the last one, but the, I would say the largest and most important one, is the ability diabetes global. The randomized comparison of luminous death saronimus eluding stents versus everolimus eluding stents in coronary artery disease patients with diabetes mellitus. There is a, also a very large executive operation committee and an even larger steering committee, which I'm honored to be part. The ability diabetes global will randomize three, almost 3,000 patients in uh, PCI to, with a luminous death plus versus the Xion's family again. And that's the randomization flow. These patients will be, well, once all the angiographic and inclusion criteria were fulfilled to abluminous or the Xion's family. And that's the situation, the global situation. There are almost 40 sites are up and running. And of course, much more will come. The enrollment status is, as you can see in these slides, is very active because we just surpassed 500 patients enrolled and we hope to be as fast as we anticipated to provide the very important results of this. Uh, this is the very large trial that we needed to confirm the signal that we observed initially, but also that's a very ambitious project because is, this is the largest trial specifically addressing patients with diabetes treated by means of PCI. So these are my conclusions. And uh, I can say that the results of preliminary experience showed that the abluminous death technology might be specifically affecting patients with diabetes. And these results be the robust rationale for the ongoing large-scale ability global randomized control trials. And thank you for your attention. Wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, we now have a discussion about this. Um, Alex, um, what do you think about everything you just heard. Luca, uh, Luca has an incredible experience. They're running the trials. Why do we need Ability DM? Well, first, I'd like to congratulate Luca. I think he's, he's been a wonderful investigator in not only this study, but many others. And, I, and I, what I think is very important, Roxana, is to combine the, the, the personal experience and the expertise with science. Right, so I think that it's a, it's a great hypothesis generating data that Luca created. And, and I think that we have to follow the, the preliminary data, the instinct that uh, this novel device can be perhaps not a perfect solution for all cases. There will be certainly cases that we're gonna see uh, restenosis, but overall, there is a, a clear trend that Luca convinced me that uh, uh, abiluminous can be a fine solution. Again, it's gonna, the final answer is gonna come from you, from ability. Uh, Roxana, if I, if I may. Yeah, uh, please, yeah. Marie-Paul, I, I didn't see you, I apologize, of course. Yeah, no, no, that, that's fine. Um, Luca, the, our uh, audience are, is uh, interventional cardiologist and you have one of the largest experience with this device. Uh, when you use it, uh, do you use it as a drug eluting balloon? Uh, I would say uh, strong predilatation, uh, long inflation, or is it, I would say, another DS for you? Well, uh, initially, I must say, I mean, I was, you know, I was not really convinced about the need for a different approach. However, I mean, this, we need to remind that to, in order to optimize the benefit, the potential benefit of combining the, the features of a drug coding balloon and a drug eluding stent, we need to use at least partially that device as a balloon. So we need to really carefully prepare the lesion. And then I don't want to talk about technicalities. Of course, there's no time for that. However, we need to keep the balloon inflated for at least 30, 40 seconds, which is something that we should not do really with a DES. But in order to provide 
that you know, homogeneous distribution of the drug, we need to keep the balloon inflated there for, as I said, 30, 40 seconds. We don't do that for DS. So I slightly changed my attitude for this device. And I, I must say that it doesn't really create any problem. It's just a matter of, you know, understanding that if there is a point in this technology, it must be used in the right way. Otherwise, this is just a DS. And we are not actually studying just another DS. We are studying a potential, you know, potential solution. I just want to say that, of course, I do not believe that any device can be the solution for a diabetic patient. Diabetic patient is a conundrum. It's a scenario in which what we can do in the cat lab is to treat the coronary artery disease. However, there's much more around. So I always stress the point that this trial will be successful according to your beautiful design plus the medical therapy and the follow-up for these patients. Oh, Roxana, another point that I would like to, to highlight here. Uh, again, th this is wonderful to talk about this unmet need with diabetes. But my question uh, to Luca and perhaps to Marie Claude, who has uh, also a lot of exposure of new devices in Europe, uh, we, are, we are insisting on, on the diabetic population. But what about Abiluminus as a workhorse for non-diabetic, for to have in your shelf for day-to-day -day practice? Uh, since we, we learned that the, the, the platform is very competitive, it navigates well, and uh, it performs well. So I think that even if we show non-inferiority for, for diabetes, not necessarily superiority, would you willing to use this device for non-diabetic for your daily practice? Well, I take the, the question first. So, uh, first of all, I mean, I will actually split this question in two. The first part is, I think we should be, you know, or practical in um, nowadays where, Please let's say, limited... Please make short because we only have two more minutes left. To okay, so I will go very straight to the point. I mean, in a, in an era of limited resources, the signal in the diabetic uh, field actually acted as a spool to create this trial. So I said, that's probably the right way to go. We don't need just another DES. And then if we show that this is at least as good as the Zion's family, well, the next step might be the step that you suggested, Alex. So let's see what happens. Very short. No, it's, it's great. Uh, I mean, I think uh, we need to kind of move to, to hear from Marie-Claude Maurice. Uh, she has a wonderful presentation on uh, the time to go global clinical trials to treat diabetes in PCI, the Ability D, uh, uh, Diabetes Global Trial. Marie-Claude Maurice, thank you so much for this. And congratulations on receiving the Ethica Award. I'm so, so excited for you. So well-deserved. Professor Maurice. Hello. I am uh, Marie-Claude Maurice from uh, Massy, France and uh, extremely happy to discuss with you about uh, the Ability Diabetes uh, Global uh, Trial. Um, as a conflict, I'm a CEO and shareholder of CERC, which is one of the two CROs conducting uh, this trial. The rationale for evaluation of uh, the device in diabetic is uh, obvious. You know that the diabetes is exploding, yeah, expected to have uh, near uh, 600 million in uh, 2013, continue to increase, and we continue to have um, an optimal treatment for those patients. Um, because the diabetes increase the risk of acute thrombosis, delay the healing, and uh, so increase the risk stenosis, especially focal edge or diffuse. And the objective of uh, this uh, the trial is to compare the efficacy and safety of abluminous DES, sirolimus eluting stent, versus the Everolimus eluting stent in diabetic patients that are eligible for PCI with minimal exclusion criteria you will see. 
We expect that 40% will be uh, multivessel disease and at least 30% acute coronary syndrome. You know the device, you spoke about it in, the, in this session already. Uh, really, uh, the, it, uh, it has uh, many advantages that could be crucial for diabetic patients. The hypothesis that we will provide more drug and greater drug delivery per square millimeter that at vessel wall, it will result in a reduction of restenosis at one year follow-up. This is our hypothesis. This is a very large uh, trial, only for diabetics. They will be followed uh, up to two years. It's pro prospective, multinational, randomized, uh, partly blindly. Uh, we will see that uh, after. Uh, primary endpoint IDTLR at one year, powered for non-inferiority and sequential superiority. And um, if uh, non-inferiority is met, we'll go in 20 countries, in 100 sites, Asia, Europe, Latin America, and why not US? And the device are the Abluminus DES versus the Xions. I say that we will be partially uh, blinded. Uh, unblinding will be, of course, during randomization, you know where you go, and during the procedure. But immediately after, the, um, the follow-up will be blinded to the study procedure to provide really uh, more uh, independent subjectivity. We want the patient to be diabetic, whoever, all-comer type of diabetic. All the known, already known, diabetes, whether they are treated by insulin or uh, oral, that's uh, fine. Or newly diagnosed uh, diabetic uh, recently. They can be symptomatic with uh, stable angina, silent ischemia, and non-ST elevation. And they can have, they must have, at least one de novo coronary artery lesion. Uh, and there is no limitation of treated lesion, number of vessel or lesion length. So you see, really, we want to capture uh, all type of patient. We excluded only the cardiogenic shock patient and the primary PCI and the severe renal failure. As said, Primary endpoint is ischemia-driven TLR at one year, powered for non-inferiority and sequentially uh, superiority. And uh, TLF, powered for non-inferiority. Uh, of course, there are, as usual, many, many secondary endpoints, but we will uh, uh, look to safety, uh, we will look to uh, bark bleeding, two or more, and um, really, we will explore all um, other endpoints. The management and organization is as follow. The concept medical is the sponsor and will uh, study uh, device supply. Mount Sinai Heart Eye Can School of Medicine uh, are in care of site selection, project management, CEC, data management and stats and CERC is in charge of uh, submission all over the world, share the project management, the contract, we do the monitoring, the safety reporting, and the core lab for endpoint related events. You see there the executive management of this trial. Uh, Roxana Meran is the chairperson of the trial. We have uh, three uh, study PI, Antonio Colombo, Alex Abizaid, and Shigeru Saito, and, uh, and a wonderful uh, steering committee, including the same people, plus uh, Dr. Malik, Ildi Smik, Dudek, Dudek, Tol, Fori, and uh, Luca Tesla. At this moment, we are at the stage of submission. Uh, 74 sites are open in Europe seven sites open in Latin America and six in uh, Asia. 
And uh, re recruitment, of course, is just beginning, but we are already above the 500 milestone. We have 543 patients that are already uh, recruited in the site I showed you in the previous slide. The largest recruit recruiter at the moment are Brazil. Uh, and then Ireland, uh, Germany, but we have also Bangladesh, Italy, Austria, the Netherlands, and uh, other countries. Recruitment really is doing well, despite the very complex situation that we are living uh, now. And uh, let's say we look forward to the completion of the trial. Ladies and gentlemen, to conclude about this uh, wonderful trial, the diabetic population is increasing worldwide and continue to have a poor outcome, despite all medical improvement. The Abluminus device represents the combination of a DES plus a DEB with the advantage, advantages of both systems and has the potential to address better this population. And Abluminus Diabetes Global is the largest head-to-head -head stent trial for diabetic conducted so far. Patients will be recruited in all continents, allowing the conclusion of the trial to be applicable worldwide. I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for this. Uh, it's great uh, to hear about this incredible global trial and your leadership, uh, 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 Marie-Claude, has been fantastic. And our partnership on this between Mount Sinai and um, CERC has been just the best experience ever. So thank you for your, for your wonderful work. Um, Alex, you're one of the top enrollers uh, and proud to be the top enroller. Tell us about your experience, even though with a difficult COVID situation, and why you continue uh, to enroll so many patients, eligible patients for this trial. You know, as, as I shared with you before, first of all, I think the inclusion exclusion criteria facilitates tremendously uh, not to exclude many patients, which is a real world uh, kind of study, which is a, a very positive feature of this trial. Uh, and again, Roxana, this allows me to highlight the fact that despite the whole COVID situation, we we'll still, we'll still see many patients coming to us very sick with a lot of uh, uh, diffuse disease, sometimes high heart failure, and we cannot ignore those patients and postpone their treatment. If we do that, they will come back in a much worse situation, particularly diabetic patients that will progress disease very fast. So I think that's a, a, a message that I can leave that Please do not ignore these patients. No, I also think it's a, a testament that when you have a really robust study, that there are a lot of us are hungry for that. And we want to get back into enrolling, into, um, you know, contributing to science and promoting the health and the human health, uh, you know, of our patients, especially those with diabetes. And if there is something to be gained here, it would be great to see it. And, and I, I love it. Uh, Luca, uh, uh, you're um, you're in, you're a part of the enrolling group. Uh, how are you doing uh, as far as enrollment? Well, I must say that you know the I agree with uh, with Alex. I mean, there is no real let's say concern about the, the enrollment besides the the situation of the let's say the workload that which has been upside down in the last year. So the thing is that. Um, there is some kind of, let's say, uh, prejudice, philosophy. I mean, I, I know that a lot of my colleagues, let's say clinical cardiologists, sometimes they only rely on the fact that these patients are typical surgical patients. So sometimes the hypothesis, the hypothesis of suggesting a different approach, PCI with a new device, sometimes can be difficult and not really very well accepted. But I, I must say that I'm honestly very optimistic. I'm sure that, you know, at the end of this, well, let's hope very soon, this pandemic, the speed of the enrollment will, will be very, very high. And uh, honestly, honestly, in Europe, of course, the rate of 
diabetic patients is not as high as in other countries, for example, Brazil, for example, in Asia. But definitely, I see a 20% of my catalog volume in a, patients are diabetic. So I'm pretty sure that we can meet the timeline. Roxana, very short comment. You know, sometimes we think the opposite. COVID can play a very important role to our uh, enrollment because who wants to stay in the hospital these days for 10 days to have an open heart surgery to be able to be contaminated in the hospital? So less invasive procedures very quickly discharge next day has been a big trend nowadays in Brazil. That's interesting. Uh, Marie Claude, uh, you know, as someone who's leading this trial seriously on and really dealing with all the operations, it has to have been a difficult year for you uh, to get 74 sites. Uh, that really is a testament of CERC, in my mind, of the kinds of things you're able to do with your team and the efforts that you put forth in, uh, in clinical trials that are run by physicians. Uh, I love it. Uh, and it's been wonderful experience working with you. Uh, what are you hoping to accomplish with the trial? And um, uh, what's your final message to the investigators who are part of this? And hopefully those other sites who might want to become investigators for you. No, um, thank you, Roxana. And thank you, uh, thank you all. Um, honestly, what is extremely important to understand is that as it was said, during COVID period, cardiovascular disease did not re diminish. It's the opposite. Patient, there is uh, more patient doing worse because they are less well treated. So uh, yes, the message to the investigators is that diabetics continue, cardiovascular continues, and don't miss any patient. We need to make progress in treating those patients. And uh, uh, clinical research in other fields than COVID must continue. That's our mission. Oh, that's wonderful. A wonderful message. I want to thank my incredible panelists, my co-chair, Antonio Colombo, the, the wonderful speeches. I mean, what we learned today, diabetes is on the rise and patients with complex disease with diabetes at the moment are to be treated with bypass. This new technology of the Abluminous DES might have a solution to those patients who are suitable for PCI, who are now chosen to have PCI, to have a solution going forward. The Ability Diabetes Study is the largest ever study in diabetic patients, 3,000 patients to answer the clinical questions that have we made improvement with an Abluminous DES system that not only coats the stent, but also the balloon, to address the problem of restenosis in our patients with diabetes. I look forward to those results. I want to thank you all for paying attention and uh, looking forward to meeting you all in person in EuroPCR 2022. But we must take in EuroPCR 2021 and keep watching and keep tuning in because the cutting edge science and clinical work is right here for everyone to listen to and observe. Thank you all for being here with me today. Thank you.